Some of you who sit in the back ought to try sitting on the front row sometime and hear the singing. Christ, our hope in life and death. Thank you, Terry. I say that as one who had to sit in recliner and sort of hear you last Sunday morning. Uh, Thank you for your prayers. I had a very, very mild case of COVID, and I am delighted to be back with you today. There was a pastor one day who was wandering through his Sunday school on Sunday morning and popped into the junior Sunday school class. And the teacher stopped and asked if he'd like to talk for a few minutes. And so he shared for a few minutes, and then he asked a question. He said, boys and girls, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? And little Jimmy shot to his feet and said, it wasn't me. (laughs) And the pastor looked at the teacher and said, I can't believe it. And she said, well, he's really a pretty honest little boy. I think we should believe him if he says he didn't do it. Well, he walked out of the the room and he ran into one of his deacons and he said, you won't believe what just happened. And he explained what happened and the deacon said, well, pastor, don't get all worked up about it. We'll pay for the repairs out of our repair budget and maybe our insurance will cover it. Now, that would not happen at Berean. In fact, it, it wouldn't happen in most churches because the story of the walls of Jericho is pretty well known even in our culture that doesn't know a lot about the Bible these days. But the story in in Joshua chapter 6 is not really about the walls. Even though my title talks about the walls. Even though that's what people focus on. The story is much more about obedience and yet that's not the whole story either. The story is really a story about God. And the story highlights for us three characteristics of God that we need to remember and that we need to respond to. And so the first one is probably the most obvious one. God is all-powerful. And we respond to that by resting in His plan. See, as we approach the story, we understand and we come to understand that opposition to God and to His plan is as futile as those 12 to 15 foot high walls of Jericho were futile in keeping out Israel. God is all powerful. We can rest in whatever it is that He is doing. And so if you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, turn with me to Joshua chapter 6. And let's begin to look at the story and learn what God has for us from it this morning. Now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. What we see immediately in these verses is that God's redemptive plan cannot be stopped. Jericho was a key battle for Israel, their first battle in the land. It's a key city because it's a pathway into the heartland of the land of promise. And God's redemptive plan, as you trace it on beyond this point, is for Israel to own the land, to live in the land, and then for eventually God's Messiah, His Savior Jesus, to come and to live there and to die there and to rise again as the Savior of mankind. God's redemptive plan hinges in some ways on Israel taking the land. And His plan is not going to be stopped. In fact, in verse 2, He says, I have given you, Jericho, past tense. It's already done and accomplished, Joshua. Now, the conversation that God's having with Joshua really began back in chapter 5. We saw that a few weeks ago. When the commander of the Lord's army, and I suggested to you that was a theophany, it was God there speaking to Joshua, began to talk to him about taking Jericho. Well, now he lays out the plan, and it's a really unique plan. Most of us know the story too well, but pretend for a few moments you don't. And think about what this plan would have sounded like to your ears. God says, Joshua, you shall march around the city. All the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. 
and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a loud shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, And let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, go forward, march around the city, and let the armed man pass on before the ark of the Lord. So you have this repetitive pattern that we're going to see throughout the chapter of God telling Joshua what to do and Joshua passing those commands on. But as the story kind of repeats itself, we get details added. They trickle out for us. First, we find that the men of war are to march around the city. That would have been some 600,000 soldiers. That was, I would suggest, a pretty wide column going around the city. They're to march around the city for six days while I think the, the people are simply watching. And when the day comes, they will join in the shout. The army marches. Then come seven priests blowing ram's horns. They're blowing them all the time, verse 8 tells us. We'll see in a moment. That's a new addition. Then the ark follows. Then there's a rear guard. We'll see that in verse 9. And we'll see in verse 10 the command to Joshua gives to the people that they're to be quiet the whole time the march is going on. So they go out, and on the seventh day then, they are to, to go around seven times, blow the horns, shout, and the walls will fall. I guarantee you, you will not find that military strategy in any military textbooks. It's a weird strategy. But the design is to show that this is all God. He's the one doing it. They aren't. In fact, this is much more a religious event than it is a military event. Ram's horns were not your normal war trumpets. They were used in Israel's worship The ark is mentioned in this passage ten times. God is central to the story. You'll find the number seven used 14 times, that number of perfection. Most of you are pretty good at math, and you know that 14 is seven times two. And you find those sevens over and over again. There's seven priests and seven trumpets and seven days and seven times around on the seventh day. All combined to show us this is not Israel, it is God that is doing the winning of the victory. They're not preparing ladders to go over the walls. They're not getting ready to tunnel under the walls. They're not getting battering rams ready to knock down the gates. They're not laying siege to the city. They're not building a Trojan horse to trick their way in. They are simply doing the plan of God. And God's redemptive plan cannot be stopped but we must faithfully obey. And that's part of the theme of this story. That obedience theme goes through the whole book of Joshua. We've seen it before. And we're going to see again the pattern we've seen before of God saying something to Joshua, Joshua passing the command on, we've already seen that, and then the people obeying the command, following through on what God has said. And so in verse 8, we begin with the words, and just as Joshua had commanded the people, they obey. The seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the ark of the covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpet and the rear guard, there's that new element, were walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually, again, new. But Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. There's a test of obedience. There's a test of discipline. They're to march around the city and say, nothing. And it happens. They get up and they march around the city day after day after day. Verse 11, so he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city going about it once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of God and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on and they blew the trumpet continually and the armed men were walking before them and the rear guard was walking after the ark. You getting the idea? And while the trumpets blew continually and the second day they marched around the city once and returned into the camp, so they did for six days. Six days. 
Now, I, I wonder, and you're going to hear me say that a few times this morning, I, I like to ask questions that the Bible doesn't always answer. Like, when did Joshua tell them the plan? Was it like the first day they got out and marched, and then day two he says, okay, everybody get up, we're marching again? Or did he tell them at the beginning? I don't know. But I do know this, that for six days they circled the city and nothing happened. And what's interesting is that when I was a kid, I always pictured this as kind of an all-day event, you know. And it probably did take them a while to get all those people organized. But Jericho was only eight or nine acres in size at that time in their history. So it would have taken them maybe 45 minutes to an hour to walk around. And then they go back to the camp and they sit there all day thinking, what did that accomplish? Obedience. If you want to know what it would have been like, you can go up to Western's campus and walk around the outside of Waldo Stadium and you will circle more than Israel circled when they circled Jericho. It's not that big. And every day they do it and they go back and they sit and the next day they do it again. And what in the world is God doing? What kind of strategy is this? It had to be confusing. It had to be a little humbling. I can imagine by day three or four at least, the Canaanites on the walls are mocking. You know, is this the best you got? You going to walk around again today? What's up with this? And they did something really, really unusual in their obedience as well. They marched on the Sabbath day. For 40 years, they never moved on the Sabbath day. And yet, if they're marching around the city for seven days, guess what? One of those days is the Sabbath. I don't know if it was day one, day seven, day four. I I don't know. But they marched on the Sabbath day. Why? Because God told them to. And they are obeying God's plan. And then on the seventh day, they obey God's plan. Verse 15, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day because they got more to do. And marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. Why? Because it was only on that day that God commanded it. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And verse 17 says the walls fell down, right? Look at verse 17. It's not what it says, is it? Verse 17 is a parenthesis. Verse 18, verse 19. Instructions that Joshua gave, I don't know, on day one or the beginning of day seven, we don't know exactly, but stuck there in the middle when we'd expect the next verse to tell us the walls are falling is this parenthesis. Because for those who are hearing or reading the story for the first time, which is not most of you, that would increase the tension. What is going to happen? They shouted, are the walls really going to fall or is this all some big mystery? Well, let's jump over the parenthesis and notice verse 20. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. And as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. And what we see is that obedience and God's power bring the victory. Yeah, it's fascinating to me that we focus on the walls falling. That gets one verse. The obedience gets verse after verse. It kind of gets repetitious, doesn't it? You think, when is this ever going to end? Which is maybe what they felt like walking around the city. But the obedience, exact obedience, is what's highlighted because that is what brings the victory. Just as an aside... There's a lot of debate over the archaeology of Jericho. There was a famous archaeologist named Kathleen Kenyon who many years ago studied the the ruins of Jericho and said, well, there was no city and no fortification when Joshua entered the land, and so the Bible account is clearly wrong. Two problems with Kenyon's uh, conclusion. First of all, she'd bought into the the liberal viewpoint uh, of a late date for the Exodus and thus a late date for Joshua's conquest. The second problem was that her conclusions were mostly based on what she didn't find in Jericho. It is always dangerous to base your conclusions on things that aren't there. She based hers primarily on pottery that she didn't find that she thought she should have found there. Kind of like a detective arriving at a crime scene where somebody's been shot and he looks at the body and says, wow, sure looks like a bullet hole, but there's no gun here. There's a knife. He must have been stabbed. No, 
The walls fell just like the account tells us. In fact, I've put on your outline, if you want to look at it a little further, a link to a video. It's about half an hour in length. Because several years ago, a man named Bryant Wood, who was a visiting professor of Near Eastern Studies at the University of Toronto, did excavation and study at Jericho, and he said, what I'm finding is exactly what you would expect to find if Joshua 6 is a true account. And so I don't have the time to go into all the details of what he points out, but you can look at that video and see, this is true. And this was God's power that brought it about. God is all-powerful. We can rest in His plan. God doesn't have Israel march around the city seven, six days and then seven times on the seventh day because somehow he's, he's generating up His power to take the walls down. He has to march around the city all those times to build into them an understanding of obedience and trust and faith. In fact, the author of Hebrews tells us that. By faith. The walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. And if you and I want victory in our lives, then we need to figure out what God's plan is, and most of that's revealed right here for us. And then be doing God's plan and trust Him for the parts of the plan that we don't know, even the parts that don't make sense. I would tell you that a week ago Thursday... When I tested positive for COVID, it was not only a surprise because I didn't feel badly, but it was a disappointment. I was mostly done with this sermon. And I was ready to preach. And as I was working on it a little more this week, you know, it occurred to me, I need to rest in God's plan. You know, maybe there's somebody here today or watching online today that wouldn't have been here last week or wouldn't have been watching last week. And maybe you need this sermon and you wouldn't have heard. I don't know. That may not be God's plan at all, but it it may be. Whatever His plan is for you and for me, we have to rest in it. And there are undoubtedly some folks here this morning who are going through situations and you don't understand what God's doing. It makes less sense than walking around a fortified city 13 times. But you can rest in His plan And know that he always does what is right. There's a second characteristic of God here. And we need to remember it and respond to it. And that is that God is abundantly merciful. And we respond by running to him, to that wonderful, merciful Savior. Even as the scene of judgment and destruction unfolds in this chapter, we see God's mercy, God's grace highlighted. Verse 17, the parenthesis. And all the city, this is Joshua speaking to the troops, and all the city that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she sent the mess- she hid the messengers whom we had sent. Show mercy to Rahab. See, mercy is promised to all who seek refuge in God, and that's exactly what Rahab did. And again, I wonder, I wonder what Rahab was thinking as Israel marched around the city day one, day two, day five, and then day seven, they're going round and round. I think I can guarantee you one thing that she's thinking. Is that scarlet cord still tied in the window? I want to make sure it's still there. Because she was believing in, trusting in the promise of mercy from God and his people. And as the story unfolds, we find that the truth that mercy is provided for all who trust in God. It was certainly provided for Rahab. And so again, we're going to see a command and then Joshua giving the command and then the command being fulfilled even as we read through the story, verse 22. But to the two men who'd spied out the land, Joshua said, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out from there, the woman and all who belong to her, as you swore to her, mercy promised. So the young men who'd been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all who belonged to her, and they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And now we get the report of it. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. 
So Joshua says to the two spies, go in and rescue Rahab. The two spies go in and rescue Rahab. And verse 25 tells us they rescued Rahab. And the point is what God promised, he fulfilled to her. And that's all mercy. We're reminded again. And every time we meet Rahab in Scripture, she's a Canaanite prostitute. She doesn't deserve mercy. But God gives not only her mercy, but her family. All those who belonged to her. All those who at least believed in God enough to hide in Rahab's house for those seven days as Israel marched. Mercy was extended to people who should have been doomed to only judgment. And then they are put outside the camp for a period of cleansing and then brought in and they are grafted into the people of God by grace, by mercy. And as we talked about several weeks ago, Rahab becomes one of the women in the line of Messiah, Jesus. That's mercy. That's grace. She's still alive when the book of Joshua is written. And she reminds us that God is abundantly merciful that we can run to him. The very first Canaanite that we meet in the whole book of Joshua is Rahab, and she gets rescued. And she's a reminder to you and me of what we just celebrated at the Lord's table, that we were doomed, that we were a wretch, that we deserved nothing but the judgment of God. And Jesus came, and he died on the cross, having lived a sinless life, and he paid for your sins and my sins, so that not only could we be rescued from judgment, rescued from wrath, but we could be grafted into the people and the promises of God. And that's all mercy. We don't deserve it, but God did it by grace. And this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you're sitting here or you're watching at home, You need to understand that there is nothing that you have done that God can't and won't forgive. Run to Him for mercy. He is abundantly merciful. Which leads us to the final characteristic of God, a very sobering characteristic of God that we need to remember and respond to. That God is absolutely holy. Repent now. That's the response. See, the story of God's mercy that we see here with Rahab is also a story of God's judgment on sin. And God in this story very clearly tells us that His judgment falls on those who refuse Him. And that might be you. You might have been saying, no, God, no, I don't want your salvation. I don't believe in your Jesus. You're not running to him. You're running away from him. And I want you to understand that this story shows us, as the rest of Scripture does, that God's judgment falls on those who refuse him. So let's go back to that parentheses again and notice it. And the city, verse 17, and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all the silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. That's the idea of devoted to destruction, that this belongs to God. It is all God's. And so you're to destroy everything except the metals, and you're to bring the metals into the treasury in the temple or in the tabernacle. Because, you see, Jericho was the first city to be conquered. It was the first fruits of the harvest of the land, and it belonged to God just like all of the land belonged to God. And the Israelites are warned that if they take any of those things that are devoted to destruction, they will make themselves devoted to destruction, which is kind of a preview hint of what's coming in chapter 7. And we have to remember that God's judgment is always righteous. Because to this point in the story, we don't have a problem, but then we hit verse 21, and now we've got a struggle. Now we've got questions, questions that have driven people away from Christianity at times. 
Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. You say, well, wait a minute, what? God told them to kill everybody in the city? Yes. And we can't dodge that. That is a hard truth. What we need to do is, is begin to come to grips with it and try to understand it because I guarantee you that the world outside these walls says, see, that's why I don't believe. Richard Dawkins, famous atheist, writes, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction, jealous and proud of it, petty, unjust, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. And he's basing that largely on the conquest of the land. So is that what's happening here? How do we wrestle with it? How do we come to grips with what is going on here? By the way, you can't draw a real contrast between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Uh, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven, about judgment. He talked more about hell and judgment than any other character in the New Testament. But what is going on here? Well, I think we need to first of all understand that this is a limited time command with a limited scope. Dawkins and others make the error of thinking Israel was always to exterminate everybody in all their wars, and that's not the case. But it is true that when they were conquering the land, they were not to make peace with those people, but were in the land during the conquest to destroy them all. And you say, well, great, that doesn't help me a whole lot. Well, let's think on about it. Let's realize this also demonstrates that evil is real. And judgment is certain. Every time Israel conquered a city, they were reminded that God's judgment falls on sin. The wages of sin, Romans 6.23, is death. So that's part of what's going on here. Part of what's going on here is also that this was radical surgery on radical evil so that it doesn't spread like the cancer doctor goes in and he cuts out the cancer and cuts out some good cells while he's doing that to make sure that the disease doesn't spread. So God ordered the destruction of the Canaanites because he did not want their evil to spread to Israel and to others. He says to them in Deuteronomy 12, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. What way? In the Canaanite way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. It's a pretty strong statement. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Infanticide, child sacrifice, their bestiality, all kinds of indescribable immorality. That was Canaanite culture and religion. And God says, I don't want this to spread to you. Deuteronomy 7, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction you shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. That's one of the reasons God did it. We also need to understand that there was opportunity for the Canaanites to repent like Rahab and her family repented. God was patient. Back in Genesis 15, God told Abraham, I'm going to send your family out of the land for 400 years because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete, and then I'll bring them back. They had 400 years for the Canaanites to repent, but instead they got worse. And then Israel crossed the Red Sea, into the wilderness. And news of that miraculous occurrence reaches Canaan. And the Canaanites are terrified. Rahab talks about that as one of the reasons she's turning to God. But the other Canaanites didn't. And so they have 40 more years hearing that to repent, and they don't. And then Israel crosses the Jordan. And we're told in Joshua, we've seen it, that the hearts of the people melt, but they don't repent. And they have the whole time Israel's being circumcised and that time that they're waiting and they don't repent. And then Israel circles Jericho once a day for six days and on the seventh day seven times 
And the people of Jericho could have thrown the gates open at any point and said, we give up, we surrender, we believe in your God. And I think God would have spared them. You say, well, how, do you, how can you say that? Because there's another city just as wicked. And God sends a prophet, a reluctant prophet named Jonah. And he goes to that city and he says, God is going to destroy this city in three days and I'm pretty happy about it. And they repent. And God doesn't destroy the city. Peter explains it. He says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that should all should come to repentance. And yet, what did we read back in verse 1? The city is shut up tight against Israel and against God. Hebrews 11 is fascinating. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient. The wages of sin is death. And the reality is, folks, that none of us are innocent. That we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. The wages of that sin is death. Instead of getting all bent out of shape about why judgment falls on people, we ought to marvel that grace is given to any of us. And what's fascinating in this story is you read the end of the chapter, you're going to see judgment on Jericho, Rahab's rescued. Judgment on Jericho, Rahab's rescued. Judgment on Jericho. And there's almost as many Hebrew words about Rahab being rescued as there are Hebrew words about judgment falling. Because God is gracious. And the bottom line, though we may not fully be able to understand why God does what he does, Exodus thirty three nineteen, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And that passage urges us, there's a merciful God. Repent now while there's time. And so the chapter ends with Joshua cursing the city of Jericho, saying if anybody rebuilds this fortification, his firstborn will die when he lays the foundation and his youngest will die when he sets up the gates. And if you read 1 Kings 16, 24, that's exactly what happened several hundred years later. Why? Because that mound of ruin was to stand as a reminder to the people that God is all-powerful that God is merciful, but that God also judges sin and you need to repent now. And Joshua sees the victory and his fame spreads, but Joshua understands it's all about God. It's not about him, that God is holy. There's a story a while back in the uh, National Park Systems magazine about a camper at Long Pine Key in Everglades National Park who decided to go for a swim even though there were signs that said, no swimming, danger, alligators. Well, she swam out to a small island along with her dog and got out and looked back, and sure enough, there were alligators in the water. And she refused to go back, and so they had to send a boat out to rescue her. And when the ranger was rescuing her, he said to her, didn't you see the signs? And she said, yes, but I didn't think they applied to me. See, there are some of you here today or watching today that you hear God is holy, repent now, and you think, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, it does. There, there are some of you that God has been marching around your heart day after day after day, calling you to faith, calling you to repentance. And my friend, I don't know when day seven is for you. But I do know that judgment does come. You need to repent now. For those of us who know Christ, Jesus died so that the holiness and the wrath of God is satisfied in his sacrifice for you and me. How thankful we ought to be for that. And how that ought to cause us to run from our sin when we commit sin and run to God in repentance again to restore that relationship. See, Jericho teaches us it teaches us about God, that we can rest in his plan, 
that we can run to him for mercy, that we need to repent now because he is holy and brings judgment. The story of Jericho isn't about the walls. Don't focus on the walls in your life. Don't focus on the the problems, the obstacles, the things you don't understand that seem to be in your way. Don't focus on the sin that you think is too big for God to forgive. It's not. Don't focus on the walls. See God and respond to Him. Rest in this fact that He is sovereign and has a plan. Run to Him for forgiveness. Repent now while there's time. Let's bow in prayer. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to think for a minute. As I was praying this morning about this sermon, part of my prayer was that there would be somebody here this morning who needs to surrender whatever the walls are that they think are too big and rest in God's plan. If that's you, my friend, would you just do that right now? Tell him you trust him. I was praying that maybe there'd be somebody here today that would understand that they need the mercy of God, would run to him for forgiveness, for salvation, or for forgiveness for sins that you've wandered away from God in. Or that there'd be somebody here this morning who needed to understand that judgment's real and would repent today. If you've never trusted Christ, my friend, right where you're seated, you can do that. You can simply admit that you're a sinner, that you're a wretch, as we sang earlier, and ask God to save you on the basis of the work that Jesus Christ did for you. Father, thank you Thank you for simple stories that we think of as Sunday school stories that are so much more that teach us about you. Now help us to respond to what we know and what we've learned. I pray in Jesus' name.